Good morning. Let's see if I can. Good morning. I've already heard and seen the talent of our speaker this morning. It's a pleasure to welcome Jim Douglas, another illustrious staff person with RLPS, graduate of Penn State with a bachelor's degree of architecture. Upon, after finishing that degree, he remained for a degree in business administration. While doing that, he taught as well as did an internship with, get this right, Robert A.M. Stearns, also known as Rams. This is a, an illustrious architectural firm in New York. Uh, those of us who watch public television probably saw the special some years ago on Rams and the impact on architecture in New York of this uh, firm. Upon graduation, he accepted a position with Reese, Lord, Patrick, and Scott. While there, he decided it was to, to further his uh, education, broaden and deepen it. He applied and was accepted at the School of the Prince's Foundation for Built Environment in London, England. Jim is a proud member of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, as well as an award-winning member of the American Society of Architectural Illustrators. It's a pleasure to welcome Jim. We've seen evidence of his talent in one field. Now we're going to find out more about drawing architecture. Okay, so first things first, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear me, that's pretty good. All right, I see a lot of familiar faces again, which is always nice. Coming back to the Quest family, I've lost count of how many of these I've done now. I think Greg Scott has me beat uh, probably by at least twice as many, but I think this might be my fourth or fifth time. Um, so today, I, I always want to do something a little different than other times. Um, Maria is correct that I do have a business degree. Most people that have business degrees always are surprised by the other things that I do, and most people that do the drawing and painting that I do are very surprised that I have a business degree. Um, so I've always had a lot of different aspects of me that I enjoy for a time, but I really like changing gears. I just think it's naturally something I do. And now that I'm, I'm turning 35 later this month, uh, I was married last year and have a three-month-old son now. So I'm starting, thank you. So I'm starting to get a little patina, at least, at least um, starting to see more of my cycles. And I think it's becoming clearer that I like these different parts of different things and enjoy cycling back through them. And I wanted to focus on drawing because I do think that's the one thing I do come back to over and over again. I like to prove that there there's practicality to building. There's people that want to know, well, I want to make sure the moisture stays out of the building. I want to make sure it's structurally sound. I want to make sure it's on time. I want to make sure it's on budget. I care about all those things because I professionally have to. But the things I love most are just, is it beautiful? Is it delightful? Do I enjoy it? Um, those are the things that excite people about buildings. The rest of them are just the things people care about. There's a big difference. I enjoy being around excited people. I enjoy working on projects that are exciting. And drawing is usually attached to that excitement. There's something exciting about drawing, and I love that it's 2016 and there's still magic to drawing, and I'm sure there will be. Um, I am an award-winning member of the American Society of Architectural Illustrators, and a lot of people say that it's like a dinosaur organization. There's a lot of people that tout that drawing is, is dead or dying, and I don't find it to be the case at all. Um, it's actually, a, my advice to any young designer that I meet with schools is always to say, learn how to draw, it makes you a lot more useful and affirm and people will grab you for meetings because they'll say, somebody will have an idea and if you can sketch it out while we're talking, that's fantastic. Uh, people get excited by it and it's also useful. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today was the impression of what an architect is. I was thinking to myself, I wonder what the average person thinks when they think about architecture. And a lot of people will say to me, you know, I always wanted to be an architect. That's a pretty common thing that I hear. Um, but I couldn't draw. You know, I, I was bad at math and I couldn't draw, so I didn't, that wasn't it. So I assume that most people think architects draw and probably use math. Um, very, very little math, I would say. Um, and depending on who you are in an office, very little drawing. Um, personally, I love drawing, so I, I work to make it part of my job. And 
think upon working to make it part of my job, it's become my job. Um, I heard somebody say once, don't, don't do necessarily what you're good at, um, but do what you love doing and become good at that. So I think that's more what I've attacked drawing to do. I think everybody, most people will say when they were a child, they drew. And then at some point when you're six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, it just starts fading away, and then you realize you don't have drawings anymore from that age. I'm not sure why that happens, but for me it just never stopped. I always continued drawing, and I always continued looking at drawings and seeing things to draw. Um, so I, I find it interesting that there's this history of drawing and architecture. It's almost like you can't have a building if you don't have the drawings first. Nobody just starts laying brick and assumes they'll figure it out while they're doing it, right? You need a plan, and that plan is done through drawing. In fact, the drawing is even called the plan. Um, but I, I saw pictures, I searched this architect and drawing online, did a quick Google search, and the kind of images I get, I love how there's a pencil involved, but it's like a blueprint, right? It wasn't drawn with a pencil, but it's like lay the pencil on the blueprint so they get the idea, and just put a ruler there, even though it's centimeters and it's the wrong scale, it's, it's such a strange marketing image. But all of them are strange, I mean, I've never worked with cluttered stuff, pencils and pens and a compass laying on top of my drawing. And uh, working with a micron ink pen on a computer printout on a triangle that's not fixed to anything, it's just gonna move when you hit it. Um, this person has their laptop sitting on their drawing, like it's gonna print out of the laptop or something, I don't know. So I think there's this symbol, there's this symbology and this language of drawing is part of architecture, whether we do it or not. Um, so I, I wanna try and clear that up, and I wanna talk about what architecture is, what drawing is, how drawing informs architecture, why architects use drawing, how they have historically, and whether they still do today, which I think is debatable. We'll, we'll talk about what that means. But we're gonna start by looking at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. I've talked about it before because it really is just, it, it basically is where architecture was codified for the first time in Western civilization. Um, Paris, France, 1648 was founded. Um, it was actually originally part of religious orders and it eventually was usurped by the King of France because he wanted architects capable of pulling off the, the majestic sort of architecture that he required. So when you think Versailles, that's why he had the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. He needed people that could communicate and use the language and understand it at that level. So he needed a school, and that's what he started, or that's what he continued. We'll talk about the Beaux-Arts influence, and the influence was worldwide, really, but talk about how it influenced America. Because the Beaux-Arts was in Europe, and we were a colony, and we did not have the Beaux-Arts influence. We had carpenters and builders, and there was a slow, slow migration of education and knowledge coming from Europe, and us going there to bring it back, saying, I've seen Europe and it's a lot better than this little shack I have. It's not, my shack's not bad, my chickens are happy, but you know, where's the delight, right? And then the modern shift. We'll talk about how the Beaux-Arts tradition, even in France, started petering out with modernism in the 20th century. We'll talk about do architects still draw today, and then I'll talk about my personal relationship with drawing. I'm gonna go really quickly because I love visuals, and if I'm going too fast, just catch up. I'm not gonna slow down. We're, just gonna, we're gonna push right through this. So why do architects draw? This is a really oversimplified graphic, but it was, it's actually, a, I, I made this again from an illustration of a book. It's actually really helpful though. You, you don't draw for the same reason all the time. You draw sometimes because you see something and you wanna draw it to record it for yourself, or actually you'll start to realize that you will see more when you're drawing it, because if you haven't looked at it yet, it's not drawn yet. So it'll force you to look at every single piece of everything. It's a really effective tool for seeing. Um, imagining, you might not see something, it might be in your head and you will draw what you're imagining. Designers do that quite a bit. And then representing, that would be more like documentation. That'd be creating instructions for somebody else to help explain something. So it's more like an instruction or Lego directions. You know, the axonometric directions for, for children to make Legos. But all those different things are, are part and parcel of drawing and architecture. So the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, um, it's a fascinating process. There are books on this now. This is a room filled with watercolor renderings of projects. This is the way projects were graded, the way students were graded. And believe it or not, there wasn't a school building before. There was just a room to dump your drawings at a certain point. So you would do your work in an atelier. That was basically an artist's studio. You would work underneath the master artist, you would be apprenticed, and you would be apprenticed in these little schools throughout Paris. And then you would come on a certain day and bring your work and pin it up and all of these uh, men that were basically, and they were men, they were not women, they were just men that would know the rules, know the accepted ways of doing things and the people that were the most excellent in the form of doing something that was the respected, acknowledged, right way to do it were the ones that were given the highest grades. 
So if you did something slightly off, if you did something poorly, you were marked, um, it, criticism was very harsh because when there is a right answer, there is a wrong answer. There were wrong answers. Uh, but one of the fascinating parts of this process, I think, that one, one of the interesting things is too, is obviously all French language. So there's certain words that they had in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts that we've never developed a better word, so we use a French word. Have you ever heard architects talk about charrettes? A charrette is sometimes a process where you involve a community or you involve a, a large number of stakeholders in the design process that's very rushed and very condensed. Um, the charrette is actually the French word for cart, or on the cart. And that meant that when you were at your atelier and you were finishing your watercolor, if it was due that day and you weren't done yet, you would actually get, when the cart came around to pick up your work, you would get on the cart and continue painting and trying to finish it while it was being dragged back to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. So that was being on charrette, just a flurry of work desperately trying to get done. And there was this, there was this idea of called the skis, French for sketch. Um, but the idea of making a sketch, this is an example of one student's options. So there were 16 options quickly created to try and give an impression of, to test options. There was a high, although it was highly refined, the final project, the early stages were all about speed. Speed was actually an incredible part of this nuanced process eventually. But you would generate as many options as possible because the more options you have, the, the better one option will be. The more options, it's better than. And you can compare them. You could pick an English style or a French style. You could pick a Baroque detail. You could grab Gothic. You could marry all these things together. These sketches are very rough, but you can start to make out things. They're almost impressionistic. And it was called indication. There would be certain things, instead of taking the time to draft a stare, you just scribble a line. And in plan, some of the scribbles start to become clear. I think you can see, maybe down here, these windows. Rather than drawing grand windows, it's just a wiggly line. But it looks like windows. It gives the impression for the speed these people were working and would arrive eventually at this sort of very formal, ordered board. Now, this is not a building elevation as we would think of it. It was a collection of different details that appear on the building and bring them all together and compose it in one sheet so the building could basically be judged as one drawing. We don't really do this anymore because we're not judged the same way. But the refined quality of uh, <laughs> this sort of rendering is just unbelievable. But there's also ways, if you look up in the right-hand corner, some of the sheets of understanding the, the language of architecture here, you need to notice something called block order. You see this ionic column capitals. Now, you might not notice, but like I noticed when I came in, these are ionic column capitals, right? So it's a similar thing, but when you're drawing it, if you're testing options, you don't have time to draw them every time if you're testing them and throwing it away. So you do a block form. You do a simplified form just to test it, see if the proportions can work, if there's a possibility, and then you move on and eventually resolve something where this, this bit drawing is interesting because see how the right half is rendered, how there's form to it, there's shade and shadow. The left half is just line and there's dimensions. So it's almost like here's the left and right side of the brains. The builder is on the left side thinking about the actual dimensions of things. The right side is how shade and shadow will affect it more the artist looking at it. All in one drawing. We start to see in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts these flat elevations because it's very difficult to draft this kind of detail in perspective. It's hard enough to do it in elevation. Perspective is almost impossible, but it was done occasionally. It was much easier, e easy is not the right word to use. <laughs> it was slightly easier than doing a perspective to do a flat elevation and then draw the context in perspective. It kind of gives the impression. But you'll notice that there was this entire system of, of developing the pieces of a building and then composing those pieces into something as a quick sketch. And you notice again, this is a sketch, there's not a lot of detail there. That would be handed in and then a certain period of time would end and somebody would have to show their completed sketch. And what they would actually do is they would keep your skis, they would keep your sketch. Also another French word, parti. They would keep that and they would compare it with what you turned in in the end. And if they were different, even if it was good in the end, if they were different, you were given a failing grade. You needed to have the conception in the very opening stage. You were given a few hours to get the main concept and then you were to follow that through with weeks of development. So the bright idea was supposed to come first. And this was almost seen as training. Believe it or not, architecture was in the Olympics. You might not know that. Look that up, that's a fascinating thing. About, I think the last Olympics, four years ago, there were articles about how art and painting and architecture were in the early Olympics. Um, this was seen as a discipline and training. Um, very difficult to do, and you basically had to flex your muscles to be able to understand this language and produce it at the speed needed. There were books filled with statuary to practice drawing something quickly with indication. 
And again, the detail that you would arrive at in the end is just unbelievable. To many people's eyes now, we would say it's gaudy, it's too much, it's ornate, it's overdone. But books and books and books about how to render these with watercolor washes, successive washes, letting it dry, going again, letting it dry, doing another phase, blending. There's actually something, a study in skyography, that's a word I didn't even know, but looking at old rendering books, skyography was the study of shadows. So it's one thing to create a computer model and put a light in the model and turn it on and see what the shadows are, but this person basically calculated this with geometry and, and would take this around to show architects, he was a delineator or, or a renderer. He would render for architectural firms and he would show them my ability to, to render shadows is you know, beyond excellent, that's what he would hope. The same way Leonardo da Vinci would carry around the Mona Lisa with him to show his capabilities. Books about how to render from a blank page and successive washes, trees, and context. Program elements, boxes would be certain rooms, so you would have the grand space here, the hallways, a bathroom, a staircase, all developed into these little boxes, and those boxes would be arranged. You might number the boxes to key them and continually make new, uh, new developments out of them. So somebody would turn in this sheet and circle the one that they said, that's my partee, that's the one I'll be compared against in six weeks when the term's over. They would develop the sketches further and further, and they would eventually develop it to this. So again, very systematic, very systematic, but incredibly detailed. And some of it was built. It's hard to believe. Nowadays, you see a lot of sketches that are never built. There's a lot of unbuilt drawings. Um, but in France, it was, it was happening. In other places in Europe, it was happening. So looking at the, the influence of this, I'm going to click through just some quick examples. Piranesi. I'm sure everyone's here has seen some work of Piranesi before. There was this archaeological aspect to it also, that the Ecole de Beaux-Arts would also have classes where you would be drawing an urn of a specific period. You would understand definite periods of architecture. Rome was a huge part of it in the Grand Tour. People would, would uh, travel to Rome to see the, the source of a lot of this architecture. Sir John Soane might be a name that you don't recognize, but he was an English architect, and he worked very closely with a renderer uh, named Gandhi, Joseph Gandhi. But this was the plan for the Bank of England, a very complex plan, very grand, very deep, an entire city block in London. It's a very grand architecture. Most people would render it something like this, but this is starting to be in the Romantic period, and this idea of the Roman ruin, you know, Piranesi started to draw these ruins, and, and Gandhi loved the ruins so much that when it came time to draw this building, even though it was a proposed building that had not been built yet, he was like, I'm gonna render it like a ruin, like it's a thousand years old. I mean, I can't even imagine going to a client and being like, this is what your building would look like if it was crumbling and old. And even the title of this is like, The Bank of England in Ruin. Um, but he did this frequently. There was, there was a competition for the House of Parliament that obviously he didn't win. But believe it or not, in some of the descriptions, it says, this is not even a serious entry in the competition for rebuilding Parliament, but rather an ar architectural fantasy on Gandhi's usual, usual lines, which was exhibited at the Royal Academy. With his sublime vision of the monumentality of the antique, Gandhi would doubtless have been unhappy with the essential condition of the competition that the style of the building be either Gothic or Elizabethan. So he just told me, he didn't even care about the rules. He's like, well, I don't like that. I'm gonna do Roman. And I'm gonna have the old building um, that burned down recently in the clouds, burning down as a symbol. I mean, this guy is just off on a tangent. You know, he's taking the Beaux-Arts and running with it into a romantic flight of fancy. And he would render this. You know, these would be the studies he would do in Rome. And he even did this rendering for John Stone. It was basically a, almost a retirement gift. This was every building that John Stone ever built. He rendered them all in one room. I think that's an incredible drawing. And again, one single light source casting shadows to prove my rendering ability. This is watercolor. I and mean, this is a, a very meticulous drawing. And this is not, we, we so often we see Pixar. You know, we think, oh, there's computer. I mean, not, this is not calculated. This is all drafted by hand. This is two point perspective on steroids. <laughs> so, meanwhile, in America, does anybody recognize this building? I hear a couple different answers. Some of them aren't right, but they might as well be. It was kind of a similar stuff. This is uh, George Washington's drawing for Mount Vernon. This was his grand vision. Uh, he would have gotten a failing grade at the Beaux-Arts. 
the occult would have just failed him in a heartbeat. Um, but this is the state of drawing architecture in America in the middle to late 1700s. So it just gives you a, 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 an understanding of the disparity. We were not building Versailles in America at that time. And this building was added onto, you know, he had a central house, he added wings onto it, so he tried to create a grand vision in the end, but if you look at the windows, you can clearly see that this was built at different times. Um, you try to make it work, you, you add symmetrical elements, you add exedra and colonnades. But men like Asher and Benjamin were creating these pattern books, trying to borrow the best from Europe and explain to carpenters and builders, this is what we need to do, these are the proper proportions. When, when I say Georgian, this is what I mean. Look at the book. So we're starting to get these references. Uh, Asher Benjamin, for example, uh, a comment was made about him from a poor boy, unaided by friends, by his indefatigable industry and talents in a few years, he, he has raised himself to the first rank of his profession. So America was starting to get the first architects. And I think previously I talked here about some of the men that were working in Lancaster in, in the early time, in around this area. Uh, Benjamin Latrobe was another one. A lot of these men were just trying to figure out how do we get educated in this? How do we learn this stuff? Here's Monticello. The drawings are getting better. This is 30 years later after uh, Mount Vernon. Richard Morris Hunt was the first American to be educated in the Cold Beaux Arts. So in our time frame, it's really important. And there aren't a lot of buildings that he did that are left because they were all on Fifth Avenue. And they were all these grand mansions that have all been destroyed for skyscrapers. But he, he did do buildings, he did pieces of the Met, and he also did the base for the Statue of Liberty, which is like an interesting thing to have said you've designed. I like to think because the Statue of Liberty was a French sculpture, that they thought, well, there's only one man in America that we would have make the base for this French sculpture. It would be the man that was trained in France and moved back. I don't think that's a coincidence. But there he is. He was a founder of the American Institute of Architects, among a number of others. But the idea of making this a profession and drawing was a piece of that. Raising the standards of drawing was raising the standards of the profession. H.H. H. Richardson also studied the Cold Bazaar. He liked to wear monk robes in his studio. Again, there's some interestingly eccentric, romantic people. You know, he, Richardsonian Romanesque, right? He was so Romanesque, he just wanted to be like a monk. He probably didn't own a Bible, but he was like, I just love, I love the garb, right? But you can see in his sketch for Trinity Church in Boston, do you see the Beaux-Arts influence? Do you see the Estes, the quick sketch, that then you develop into a better plan in perspective drawings? And then finally built? Another sketch he did. Again, the indication. Here's the general thing, you get the idea, scribble, scribble, scribble. I don't have time. And he didn't have time, he ended up dying in his early 40s. Sir Edmund Lutchens, an English architect. We're getting a little later now. He hovered around the First World War, a monument for the First World War. He designed, you can see his stationery here. This is his esquisse for a monument, he scribbled it out. But it's pretty much all there, right? The idea of the voids, the idea of the triumphal arches stacking. <coughs> so then the modern shift. And the modern shift is interesting um, in a lot of different ways in architecture, but in drawing it affected a number of things. We talked about Mies van der Rohe before. Here he is, pleasant guy. Look at this guy. He's like if Alfred Hitchcock had no personality, <laughs> right? If, Al if Alfred Hitchcock hated movies and people. Um, but this is a drawing he did. And it's interesting that it's almost like not even a drawing. It's a photo montage. He's drawing on top of photos. So the same way that the French architect Corbusier is saying, why aren't buildings more like automobiles? You know, why, why, why don't they have a machine for living in? Totally different than the Beaux-Arts. This is not Grecian urns. This is not grace. This is speed, power, modernity, white, sterile, clean, international. No, no national, national ties to countries that are at war. This is above war, it's clean, it's the future. This is 1922, 1921, I'm sorry, even earlier. 1921, and he's talking about a sharp glass shard. I mean, we just built this in London, England, you know, a couple of years ago, the shard building, if you look it up, it's very similar. It's almost 100 years later. That's how, that's how bleeding edge, not even leading edge, bleeding edge he was. There were so many people that did not, not like this. There were other people that said, this is incredible, I can't even, I couldn't have fathomed a glass building, solid glass. So he, he was sketching these options of it. 
He was also, instead of doing drawings, he was doing collages. So you can see the influence of Picasso, of Wang Gri, and, and modern artists. He was talking about, what if we just had this grid, basically just this blank space, this international, universal space, and we plumped down some sculptures at interesting points for just a feeling of balance. And maybe there's, there's got to be a post here, because there's going to be a ceiling. But as little structure as possible, and maybe a painting in the back if it's a Picasso. But you can see that influence in his architecture. And you can see how sterile this is compared to those art design. This is not encrusted and encrusted and developed and developed. He basically would do the diagram and then build the diagram. And then Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn is, again, a slightly later modernist, so he's not really the first wave. He's more like the second wave of modernism. And I think there's an interesting thing that starts to happen because early modernism started to fail. A lot of people didn't want to live in white, sterile boxes. So you see something here, but again, there are a lot of images of him sketching. So I think a lot of these men had these images taken of them. They knew the photo was being taken, but they wanted photos of them sketching because it was critical to how they saw themselves. Because architects don't build anything. We're not actually out on the site laying bricks, so what do we do? How do you explain what you do? Well, that's the genius of my drawing at my table with my papers. He probably placed these here for the sake of the photograph, just like those marketing images. I bet you he would like work with a clean space so he could do what he was doing, but if you're gonna take a photo, let me really crowd it up, show what I've done. Interesting thing with him, you may or may not know, when he was three years old, he was so, this is the story anyway, a very poetic story, but he was so engrossed with burning cinders that he picked up a cinder and put it on his clothes to try and carry it and set himself on fire. That's why he's got this scar all around his chin, had it for the rest of his life. But I think, in a way, I think he actually liked that story because it showed that he just had this attraction to life, this attraction to a phenomenon. It was like this magical Prometheus thing that he had tapped into, even at the age of three. The same with Picasso, you know, I was fully born when I was born. I was a man at, at one. That, that modern concept, I think, was really important to them. So, unlike the Beaux-Arts that would go here, meticulously measure everything, meticulously draft it, do pro progressive gradations of, of watercolor washes to perfectly capture exactly what was there or reconstruct an archaeological truth about what would have been there. This is what Louis Kahn draws. Again, this is a modern designer looking at it. It's more about color, it's more about form, it's more about a story, it's more felt, there's like a vigor to this. It's not a cold, perfectly formed thing. You can sort of see the scribbling in this one. So again, some of that scribbling was present in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts drawings in the early sketches, but then that, that impression was sort of obliterated and the end thing was like a mausoleum, very tight, very finished. St. Mark's in Venice. I'm sure there are people in this room that have been here. This is Louis Kahn's impression of it. I don't know that I would have liked this drawing much 10, 15 years ago, but it's definitely growing on me. I love the chaotic quality of it now, the color of it now. A lot of, a lot of color can be very difficult. When you're doing value, meaning light to dark, to, to be an artist juggling value at the same time as you're juggling color can be very different, so difficult. So oftentimes, especially in watercolor washes, you work in, in black ink. It's just a great issue of tone. It's a mono, monochromatic drawing. And they, they tend to be very boring, especially when you see a lot of them together, even if they're beautifully done. This is like, has a lot of verve to it. You know, this is exciting. Campidoglio in Rome, that's how Louis Kahn sees it. There's this, a different thing you start to see here with modernism, that, that a singular impression is important. This isn't the way it's seen, this is the way I, Louis Kahn sees it. This is the way I see it. And it's different than the way you see it. And mine might be better or not, but I like my way. The Ecole de Beaux-Arts was about ironing out those those unique qualities. It was about, this is the way France sees it. This is the way the king sees it. Um, it wasn't about individuals, but for Louis Kahn it was. So when he develops master plans, there these scribbly, symbolic, brightly colored, phonetic things. And he would eventually still have a strong parti, he would still have a strong concept of how to iron this out. So if he had a building, the Salk Institute, for example, if it, if it had a strong view, which way do you think is the view? This way or that way? You can tell which way the building is looking, right? It's looking this way, right? It's looking out. You can see where its eyes are looking in that direction. And that's because he's created this very bold, broad stroke. Look at that phenomenon. It becomes cosmic. 
You know, it's very interesting. And it's more about the light. Remember him picking up those coals as a child. This is more about the light than it is about the building. The occult of the Beaux Arts made it all about the building, the building, the building, you know, the perfection of the building. And he would make the building as a, basically a cup to hold this phenomenon that you could just witness. So then do architects still draw? So we've kind of moved through historical times, through the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. We've come through modernity and that twist. The individual is back. Um, but you can see that there's a twist to drawing that Louis Kahn also probably couldn't draw a Beaux-Arts drawing, right? He actually could draw pretty well. When he was young, he did train that way. So he did have some nice drawings, but he pushed away from it on purpose, similar to what Picasso did. Had the ability, but had a different interest. Frank Gehry, for example. So we're talking about architects that are alive and practicing today. <laughs> now I'm sure everybody in this room knows Frank Gehry's architecture, right? Very contemporary, very well known. You know, that's his drawing for a building. I don't think the French Ecole de Beaux-Arts would know what to do with this. I don't think they would, they just wouldn't know what to say. But what's fascinating, and the reason I include it, is that he does occasionally have these sort of sketches a lot of them are done after the fact, just as sort of like, here's my impression of my own building now that it's built. But oftentimes now, and almost entirely now, he will model the building first, and they'll computer scan the model and produce drawings from it to be built. Oftentimes there aren't even drawings. There's just a computer model that's sent to fabricators, and they'll fabricate the steel based on a, a computer model that you'll send to basically a 3D printer or a steel fabrication machine or any, whatever material you're working with, that basically you never had to draw anything. You, you model it. Which I have to admit, it's interesting. For myself, it just isn't where I want to work. Um, but it's a fascinating process, and it is something that's new. It, it's never been done this way before. Todd Williams and Billy Chen. You might know these designers. Have you been to the Barnes Foundation, the new Barnes? They designed the building, in case you didn't know. They're a husband and wife architectural firm in New York City. This was a sketch for the American Folk Art Museum, the facade of it, and again, showing that they are hand drawing. And you can see here that the facade of the building almost looks like somebody just punched it, you know, and impacted the, the front of it. They developed those drawings, and it was built that way. They actually cast the, the facade on the floor uh, in a warehouse, and then tipped up the panels and reassembled it on site. This building was just recently demolished for the expansion of uh, Melma in New York. It's one of my favorite buildings in New York City. But again, one of the drawings they did, and again, this is a very simple drawing, but this is a drawing they did for the Barnes Museum. It says, gallery and a garden. So there's the gallery and the garden. They said, garden and a gallery. So there's the garden and a gallery. And this is, garden and a gallery and a garden. <laughs> but you have to admit, even though this is modern, even though this was done in 20, probably 12, 13, there's a sense of that Ecole de Beaux-Arts, the esquise of I'm going to test some options quickly, right, before I get too deep in the weeds on this. And in the end, when you look at their building, there is a garden within a gallery within a garden. Right? It's still there. It's a daytime shot, a nighttime shot. So the logic still holds up at times. David uh, Jameson, another architect, specializes in residential architecture. There he is, looking interesting, I might add. You have to look interesting, right? You always have to hang on your own things. You know, Mies Vader had to sit in his own chairs. But again, this is a sketch just on a, a printed out piece of paper. This is not like the beautiful paper that the Ecole de Beaux-Arts would use for watercolor washes. This is just like came out of the printer and he had an idea. Uh, he mentioned to me that he was thinking about salt. He called it the NaCl house, the sodium chloride house. Because he was just thinking how salt forms in these blocks. And he was sketching out that way, and that's the built project. You know, it's, it's reasonably close. And I think that's sort of the way he thinks with his buildings. So again, I think we have plenty of time here that I wanted to get, a, a couple of people last time asked me, um, what, what do I do? You know, what, what sort of drawings do I do? And I've never really included anything about myself, so I thought it was important. And I had to call this my relationship with drawing, because again, I have an MBA, which is kind of one part of me. I had an architecture degree, which is one part of me. Um, I moved to North Carolina to study in an atelier and do uh, figure drawing. And then I also was a full-time student, enrolled, took the training three days a week to PAFA, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philly, to do a um, painting program while working full-time. And enjoy all those different parts of me. So this is some of 
the story of how drawings sort of shown up in my life and my work. Um, this is me with uh, Craig Walton and Eric Roberts from RLPS Architects. We're traipsing around in uh, Naples, Florida, about to just get a downpour on us looking at a site. Um, but that's sort of how, like, once I got out of school, you're, you're literally in the weeds. You're like walking around sites and saying, like, what are we going to build? You know, how's this going to work? And drawing is an answer. Um, and because I could draw, I would often be invited to these sort of meetings that were more senior level people. Because it was the people with the ideas and the thinking and the money and the know-how. And if you could help represent that quickly, you were invited to the table, literally. Um, so there I am. There's my sketch. I should have put more sketches. I should have piled them high and said, look at these sketches. I should have been wearing a monk's robe. I wasn't thinking. I was, I was too caught up. But, you know, aerial views for projects. You know, a lot of detail. Still do elevations. This is drawn by hand, scanned into a computer, and digitally colored. So this has the impression of sort of a Beaux-Arts watercolor wash feel to it, but it's digital color, because I don't think Beaux-Arts people had to deal with the client saying, what if the roof was brown or green once you've done it? You say, well, I don't know, that's, that's gonna take a while. Um, and then they change their mind back and say, you know, do you still have the red one? Because I, I did like it red, I did. Um, so digital allows you to make those sort of changes. Quick sketches to represent houses. Again, aerial views to help explain master plans. There's a lot of detail here. Every little balcony, every little thing has to be sorted out. You get an impression, um, but again, there's a lot of little pieces to it. I include this building. Um, this is part of me moving to Lancaster. Some of this is kind of chron uh, chronological. I moved to Lancaster, saw this building, thought it was interesting. Didn't know the story behind it. I just decided to measure it, so I just measured the whole damn thing. I don't know why. Architects are like that sometimes. You don't know why. <laughs> Business people do not understand that. I would do things like that in the MBA program, and be like, what, you don't want to just measure something sometime? I'm like, no, I have no interest in that whatsoever. Do I get paid for it? <laughs> uh, well, once I measured, I did some research and found some photos. I was like, are you kidding me? This is in front of Watt and Shand. You know, many of you might know this now, but this was new to me. I was new to Lancaster. I was like, well, why the hell is it there? <laughs> and so they were selling war bonds out of it. So I recreated it, because it was painted, you know, this, this weird color, I don't know why. So from the pictures, then I recreated it. So I did my Beaux-Arts take on it, you know, I was restoring this, you know, archaeological thing. This is my Rome, right? But it's meticulous, as meticulous as I can make it. And that's hand-drafted, that's ink. Um, and then just recently it was repainted. I think there were actually some people, um, part of Quest, that mentioned that they were a part of the fundraising effort for this to save it. But I think drawing things taps you into things. It makes you look again. So this was St. James. And I include two drawings I've done at St. James. I, I lived on the block. I was married in his church. William, my son, is going to be baptized here in May. So the church was meaningful to me. But you see two different drawings. The left one is what a builder would care about. The left one is how he would draw it to explain it to somebody. The left one counts brick courses. You know, 24 courses, 11 courses. How many steps, how many corbels, how many... You know, it's, it looks like the building. It does. But it doesn't look like this. There's no impression of light. There's no impression of how the sun sets on St. James. No, that's the right image. You have to draw it twice. And that's why I started to realize, and that's why I study different ways of drawing, because certain drawings do certain things, but you can't have one drawing that does everything. It just doesn't get the whole thing across. This is what I moved to North Carolina for a time to do. I worked remotely and drove back to North Carolina one week out of the month to work in the office. Um, was drawing plaster casts. Uh, that's a drawing about yay big out of pencil, just really softly rendered. And now after drawing one of those, I don't need to draw them anymore because they take so long to do. It is unbelievable. It is just, it's almost not contemporary to spend so much time on something. It's a beautiful act, but it's almost like meditation. But I would study paintings rather than buildings. I would study carving and sculpture by Michelangelo's details or paintings. I would look at buildings and render them rather than hardline edge them. You know, architects have a way of basically putting a line on everything, where painters will have lost edges. So where does one thing end and another thing start? You don't necessarily know. This roof edge is really just where that black shape stops. There's not really a line there. Started drawing when I came back to Lancaster. I barns are great. Would do sort of old pen and ink style versions of buildings. Um, I moved to Connecticut for a time, did some shingle style architecture. 
did some renderings for final buildings. And this is just an impression of, this is an Ephrata, just walking down Main Street in Ephrata. Saw a bay that just jumped out at me and thought it looked really interesting, so I have to draw it. I have to look at the details of how each thing's resolved, front elevation, plan view. Drawing of a church in Connecticut where I was working, driving home, and the sun hit it the right way, I thought I should draw that. <laughs> There's a penny for scale. This is tiny, I mean really tiny. When you try and draw something, you realize how difficult it is because you're sitting in a car, or you're like, you're outside and you're like, it's really windy. You, you don't realize what it's like to tackle wind. I have clips for everything now. My bag is just a cluster of things to help me fight nature to try and record things. Um, but I would draw people at the same time. So there's a quarter for scale. So these are, again, very small wash drawings. I think I spread a stair. I started to realize I never really cared who it was. If it was a great picture, if it had good light, it was like, yeah, it's spread a stair, whatever. Or, you know, it's a plant, or it's a building. It's sort of like, it's just beautiful light. And that sort of is why I think I can start to respect Louis Kahn with that take. Uh, these are figure drawings I did with ink wash. These are five minutes. So you have five minutes. Again, it's like in the skis in the Beaux-Arts. You have five minutes, capture the big thing. There are two values of gray here. You know, the model's gonna move in five minutes, so do the best you can. What's the impression? Not what's ever, no fingernails, no nostrils. Just form, shadow, general impression. Let's white out for the edge. That's all I had. Drawing people on the subway, you start to realize when they're when you're not paying them to sit still, people don't sit still. <laughs> But what's fascinating is when you start to get over the fact, you start to, uh, I don't have to be so meticulous about this. I started drawing this guy here, I think. And then he moved, so I started drawing him here. Then he moved back, so all right, the nose is gone, so I'll start drawing him here. Then he put glasses on, I was like, oh, that's great. <laughs> this woman fell asleep while I was drawing her. I'll watch movies. This one's in Bruges. Have you ever seen that movie? It's interesting. Brendan Gleeson just had a great face. So I just paused the movie and was like, I'm going to draw this. My wife does not like to watch movies with me. I just kind of like <laughs> pause them. Oh no, he's inspired again. I'm going to go make coffee. But again, this, this is, to me, this is architecture. There's architecture in this space. It's built up. It has mass, it has shape, it has value, shadow. It has these pieces and parts. Go to a museum, try to represent things the best I can. The more I'm able to represent whatever I see, whatever I see, the more I can represent anything I need to for a meeting, or anything, you start to be able to imagine better the more you've seen. So again, these are pretty rough and loose, or white out for highlights. There's me, I was kind of tired. <laughs> but one thing I did here, I used, I used to draw with a pencil and I would be really meticulous and really light, right? Have you ever seen people that like, kind of like feather, like the furry drawings that people get? So I used to be really timid, and then I thought, well, I need to get over this. So I'll use ink. I'll use like an ink pen to do my underdrawing. And believe it or not, there's, a, there's an ink underdrawing there. Can you see it? I used a red pen. And I was like, I can't erase this. It's just going to be there. i got to relax and loosen up. And sure enough, you can obliterate it. You can, the general impression can read through that, which I think is fascinating. And that's kind of the same thing that happens. If you ever seen a really beautiful building, you're like, oh, that's beautiful. I love a photo of that. And you take a picture, and you're like, oh, the stop sign's right in the way. But you never noticed the stop sign before until you took the picture, because you, you visually you just imagine it away. This was Craig Walton, who worked at RLPS and retired recently, um, but I asked him to sit for a portrait. So this is me working up. I was using Sharpie. I wanted to use tools that reminded me of Craig, because he was a designer in the office. He would always have Sharpie. He would have drafting dots stuck to his sleeves. He would have like a tear in his pants and ink all over his hand. One time I saw a man's phone upside down, and he could faintly hear the voice, but he said, I'm sorry, I can't hear it, I'm, I'm sorry, please call back. He was that kind of guy, I loved him. So I thought, if I'm gonna capture him, right, I can't do this clean, a cold of Ozone, he's not that sterile. I and mean, this guy has a verb, right, so we gotta use some of that Louis Kahn quality. So I used a Sharpie, let's bang out some, some shadow shapes. Let's scribble in some tone, right? If there's space in between the black lines, then there's, there's grays. So we have grays, even though we have just one black sharpie. Well, let's scribble some pencil on top of the marker. 
All right, there's tape now. I put masking tape, just strips of masking tape on this for texture, you know, just for the heck of it. There's a coffee stain. I set a coffee mug on his knee. You see that? And again, one thing is this is all better in person. It's one reason why you should still go to museums and look at actual pieces of art. It's one reason I love drawing, because the print isn't the piece of art. There's an artifact, and Craig asked to buy it from me. He wouldn't accept it for free. He made me take money for it. But I look at that and I see Craig. Even his glasses hanging from his vest. The other benefit you have is th these things take time. So we probably sat for about two hours while I was doing this, and you talk the whole time. And the better you get talking through somebody, having their jaw move, or even if they move their head, it really starts to not bother you, because you've been on the subway drawing people moving all the time, right? So you start getting used to that person moving and being themselves, and then you start to notice the mannerisms, like, oh, I need to draw that, because that's classic, the way he sort of hunches a little bit, or something he does with his hands. For me, the best part about this is his hands, because that's always the way he would kind of sit. Very polite, kind, gentle man, and I think it comes across, even if you don't know. But there's the progression. Um, oil painting, I'll do studies. I ripped out, uh, I, I sat in for the last little bit of the, the Johnson uh, presentation before mine. So I don't remember Johnson, I wasn't alive then. But I grabbed a sketchbook from 1965, so that's my connection to the Johnson lecture. <laughs> so this is a, a yearbook, an old yearbook I, I, I found. And I was like, I'm just gonna paint nine faces, just random nine faces. Um, so this is a bigger board, 18 by 24 maybe. Start on the left, again, just block shape. Which, like in the skis in the Occult of Beaux Arts, isn't it amazing how obvious these are people? I mean, you can clearly tell them, you even have some personality. Developing with a little more value over here on the right. And then again here, developing more. Once you get down to little eyebrows and things like that, everything's pretty much already set. So looking closely at just one face, there's just the progression of built up details. And when you're doing something with architecture, it's just like each one of those pieces of, of paint is actually like a piece of molding. So it's like, well, if I want a shadow, I'm, I'm going to need this projection. If I want the shadow to be this deep, it needs to project this much, because that's what the light's going to do on it. So you start to paint with buildings. Uh, this is Roseville Pike. But when I travel, um, I like to travel abroad a lot, see things, try to draw everything I see. Again, messy sketch. Screwed up a proportion, whited it out, draw right over it. It was raining, so it's like spattering my red ink anywhere. It really doesn't matter. It's a church in Maine. I saw this picture. I was there in summer, though, so I drew a quick study of it, just in ink. This is Lancaster. I just you tend to like I like just like to filter things. Sometimes it's more meticulous than other times. This is more about dimensions and specific details. So is this one. In fact, it had to go sideways on a sheet. I didn't have time to copy it, but it's symmetrical, so there you go. The right side is the left side. I try to take pictures while I'm doing this thing. So you can see the jump between there's just the line work, there's the value. The value really makes things pop. And then there's some color laid on top of it. Done. You know, 20 minutes. Um, Lancaster, if I see a detail like this, did this with a couple markers and a color pencil over top, but I had to do this when I was done, just some bright, bold, colorful, different take on it. So I did the Monument Men, exhibited these at uh, City Folk in last year, I think. But again, drawing plants or a building, kind of the same thing, same play of light. I see a building I want to draw. You start to see the build-up process to it, and impression. And there's a lot of wonky, garbly stuff in here, but it all holds together. If the broad strokes are there, everything usually holds together. This is a sketch I just did uh, recently in Philadelphia with a sketching group. It was raining, so I'm standing under a parking deck. <laughs> you can see here, I can find an open parking deck. So again, once you're outside, you are outside. Now, there were no wild dogs, fortunately, but that's how it works. There's the final sketch there. But I now do uh, sketch tours. Uh, this was the AIA National Convention in Atlanta. So on the left, I did an impression of this is a five minute sketch. On the right is a 45 minute sketch. There's more detail, but it's the same impression, right? So compare one to the other. Just, I mean, the Ferris wheel, you can see more detail, but really to me, they're basically equal value. 
So people would gather their sketches together and throw them in a big pile and talk about sketches. So architects do draw. That's kind of the proof I'm trying to say here. Uh, drawing presenters during the, the talk, just to prove that you can draw people, these are two-minute sketches. I had them all sign the sketch. I'm looking forward to looking at the sketch 50 years from now, when most of the people are gone, or maybe I'm gone and somebody else is looking at the sketch. But drawings have a way of being something special. Here's David Jameson when he came to give a talk. He signed the drawing for me. Todd Williams, Billy Chen, when they came, they signed the sketch. I did five sketches and just said sign the one you like the most, and they did. And then I'll end here with, this is uh, recently moved into a house uh, just after having William. So this is Pleasure Road over in Grandview Heights. And just the view out my window, right through the winter, you know, the different impressions of a place. And so you just have to want to start to draw it and represent it. But there's my little kid. So I like to think drawing is alive and well, and I think our time is done. So I hope everybody enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too much about me. <laughs> so take care. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's often the case. So if the rendering is needed.